Hi friends, welcome back. We are going to keep reading The Outcast of 19 Skylar Place by E.L. Coningsburg. Once again, I want to remind you, I obviously do not own the copyright to this book. I'm just reading it out loud for educational purposes and so that we can have a great discussion together. All right, so last chapter, we read chapter one and we found out a little bit more about our main character, Margaret Rose Kane, and how she was not getting along at summer camp. Every activity she was asked to do, she just said, I prefer not to. And her uncle, Alex, is coming to pick her up. So we are gonna pick back up with chapter two. Jake the handyman was assigned to drive us back to Epiphany. I recognized him because he had been called to Meadowlark Cabin three times. The first time was to exchange a bunk mattress, mine. The second time was to make a shower that wouldn't drain, drain. And the third time was to clean up a mess. Each time he came, he shuffled in, fixed what he was supposed to, and left without saying a word. He seemed borderline autistic, which would be Asperger's disorder. Both disorders were known to occur more frequently in males than in females. Because of his mental problem, whatever it was, I wasn't certain he recognized me. I also wasn't certain that he should be driving a car. Uncle didn't seem worried. Of course, Uncle was hardly one to judge. His lack of driving skills was in the court records. We were being driven through the Adirondacks, which according to the brochure is the beautiful setting of Camp Taliqua, where campers have at their disposal the pristine riches of Mother Nature, plus the convenience of our camp facilities, the warm companionship of fellow campers, and the friendly guidance of experienced counselors. The pristine riches of Mother Nature. On the first evening, everyone's parents had departed. We were sprayed with insect repellent and invited into Taliqua's pristine riches to hear Mrs. Kaplan give her welcome campers talk. The convenience of our camp facilities. The camp was divided into eight cabins, eight girls in each cabin. Each cabin had a bird name. Each cabin door had a picture of its bird. There was Hummingbird, the youngest, all eight-year-olds, Nightingale, Bob White, Cardinal, Oriole, Robin, Blue Jay, and Meadowlark. I was to be a Meadowlark. We were all 12 years old. Being an only child, I had always had a room of my own, so I went off to my assigned cabin, curious about what it would be like to share night breathing with seven other girls. That first night, our camp cabin counselor, Gloria Goldsmith, we were to call her Gloria, put slips of paper numbered one to eight into a bowl and told us to pick one. The number on our paper would be the order in which we'd choose our beds. All the cabins were alike, two bunk beds along each of the long walls, one bed on either side of the window. The bathroom, two shower stalls, two toilet stalls, and four sinks was against the short wall in the back opposite the door. By a small margin, the best bed was the top bunk by the window farthest from the door. The worst, the bottom bunk closest to the door, but there was not much difference among them. Of the eight meadowlarks, I was the only one who had never been to a sleepaway camp before, and Berkeley Sims was the only one who had not been to Taliqua before, although she had been to one camp or another every summer since she was nine years old. The other six all knew each other. This would be their third year at camp, their third at Taliqua. They knew the songs, the schedule, the counselors, everything. They were the alums. There were other alums scattered throughout the camp, but the Meadowlark alums had made rooming together a condition of their coming to Taliqua. Alum Ashley Schwartz got number one and picked the top bunk away from the door. I got number two and picked the other top bunk away from the door. The third top bunk went to alum Blair Patiani and Berkeley Sims, the other new girl, got number four. She picked the remaining top bunk. Gloria assigned us a cubby nearest our bunk and reminded us that there were to be no showers after 10 and lights out would be at 1030. Beds were to be made every morning before we left the cabin. Any questions, she asked. There were none, so she left to do some paperwork. Gloria was hardly out the door before alum Ashley Schwartz asked Berkeley Sims and me to switch beds with Heather Featherstone and Alicia Silver. Alicia had drawn a lower bunk by the door and Heather had drawn the lower under mine. Berkeley agreed to switch and immediately started climbing down from the upper bunk. Ashley then said to me, Heather will help you move your things. And I replied, that won't be necessary. Surprised, Ashley said, why? Because I'm not switching. Heather asked, why? And I said, because I prefer not to. That was the first time I said it. The warm companionship of fellow campers. The morning after bed selection, I went to breakfast with the seven other meadowlarks. Berkeley Sims and I sat next to each other on one side of the table and the alums crowded together across from us. They seemed curious about Berkeley and me. Berkeley was also an only child. Her mother and father were divorced and her father sent her to camp every summer to use up most of his custody time. She'd been to tennis camp when she was nine, to water skiing camp when she was 10, and to cheerleading camp last year. Alicia Silver said, you'll like Taliqua better. It's not just one thing, it's crafts and nature study and some sports like swimming. The other girls nodded in agreement. In one version or another, they all said the same thing, that Camp Taliqua offered variety. 
Berkeley's history made mine seem boring. I told him my parents were still married, that summer they still were, and my mother was a professor in the psychology department at Clarion State University, and my father was the registrar. Blair Patiani said that Clarion State was where her mother and father had gone to college and where they had met. The girls all seemed friendly enough. <clears throat> I was curious about Berkeley, the other new girl. Having grown up with two parents who worked at the university, I knew that Berkeley in California was the home of a campus of the University of California, famous for sit-ins and very liberal political views. My father did not approve of sit-ins or liberal political views. My father did not approve of California, except for the fact it had given us Ronald Reagan, who was the president of the United States at the time. My father loved President Reagan. Is Berkeley where you were born? I asked. Where I was conceived, she answered, which stopped conversation until Heather Featherstone, whose name was also a little strange, smiled slyly and explained that while we were in camp, real names did not matter because the alums called each other by their nicknames. What shall I call you? I asked. I can't tell you, Heather replied. Our nicknames are secret. We can't tell you until you have one of your own. I don't have a nickname, I replied. Everyone calls me Margaret or Margaret Rose. Rose is my middle name. Heather looked to her left as Ashley Schwartz and to her right at Caitlin Lorenzo before saying, well, you don't give yourself a nickname. We give you one. The three of them nodded. How can you do that? I asked. A name is something your parents give you, just like your parents gave you Heather. Ashley Schwartz joined in. We're talking about a nickname, not something you put on a report card. After we give you a nickname, we tell you ours, Caitlin said. Everyone has to have a nickname. And I thought to myself, I don't. After breakfast, we were divided into three groups in a mix and match arrangement of ages and cabins. We were to do a round robin of lessons for each of the three instructors who had gone to clown school. I was separated from the other meadowlarks. When I returned to the cabin during the break between makeup and juggling, I found that my bedclothes were all rumpled, even though I had made my bed before leaving. I climbed up to the bunk. My covers had been pulled back and a big wet spot filled the center of the mattress. I smelled urine. Furious, I climbed down and waited for the other meadowlarks to appear. I was determined to find out who had done this and confront her. I waited and no one came. I didn't know where they were or what they were doing, but I knew that wherever and whatever, they were together and it had all been worked out beforehand. And the friendly guidance of experienced counselors. I set out to look for my counselor and found her in the mess hall talking to the other counselors. I approached and asked if I could have a word with her in private. Gloria looked concerned as we walked to the far corner of the room where no one could hear us. I described what I had found in the cabin. Gloria put a hand on my shoulder and said, it's all right, Margaret, a lot of girls have accidents. After all, it's a strange bed. These are unfamiliar surroundings. I protested, but I didn't wet my bed. Someone else did. Sure, sure, I understand. Gloria all but winked when she said she would let the wet bed be a secret between us. I'll just tell Jake to take the old mattress away and bring in a new one. But I didn't do it. We know, we know, Gloria replied. Don't worry about it, it will be taken care of. I persisted. You saw that my bed was made this morning before I left the cabin, didn't you? Gloria replied. That's probably why the spot didn't dry out. My bed was not wet when I made it this morning. I did not wet it. Someone else did, Gloria said. That will be awful hard to prove. I realized that yes, it would be. The evidence was stacked against me. I started to walk away. Gloria called me back. Bending close to my ear so that no one else could hear, she said, I'll have Jake change the mattress before lunch. We'll not say anything to anyone about this. I won't even do the paperwork on it. Warm companionship. The alums were not as subtle as they thought they were. At dinner, Ashley said she had requested a room deodorant because she thought she had detected a strange odor when she came into the cabin after clown class. Then after sliding a glance at me, Caitlin volunteered that her mother had sent her an extra set of sheets in case anyone in Meadowlark needed them. Alicia said she had a friend whose little brother was a habitual bedwetter and he had a rubber sheet on his bed for precautionary reasons. Stacy said, I hope no one in Meadowlark has to. I heard that they make your bed real hot. In the evening, the alums whispered their secret nicknames to each other. By careful listening, I learned that Stacy Morganis was named Dolly because she had one of the expensive handmade, not manufactured cabbage patch dolls that she brought with her to camp and apparently everywhere else. Heather Featherstone was fringy because that was what she called the worn cotton security blanket she could not sleep without. Ashley Schwartz was tattoo because she had one. She was proud of her tattoo and often let it show when she was getting dressed or undressed. I heard her tell Berkeley that her parents had never seen it. I couldn't decide if she was bragging about how modest she was or how little her parents saw of her. Caitlin Lorenzo was B cup because that was her size of which she was very proud. And even though I too would have been proud to be a B cup, I would have never let them call me by that name. I would just let them be.
By the evening of the second day, they had given Berkeley her nickname. I had no trouble finding out what it was. They had chosen Metal Mouth for her. She wore braces. Although I could tell the alums were proud of their choice, I thought it was unimaginative. I knew they wanted me to hear, so I wouldn't want to be the only one left out of their secret nickname society. On the evening of the third day, Ashley Schwartz approached. She asked me to please step down from my bunk so they can initiate me. The Meadowlarks had thought of a wonderful nickname for me. I didn't want one. I liked my real name. Names were important. Uncle Alex had told me about how language was God's gift to man, how God had asked Adam to name the animals. So he brought every beast of the field and every fowl of the air to Adam and let Adam name them. Naming was so important, it was the second thing God asked Adam to do. I was Margaret, Margaret Rose, Margaret Rose Kane. I had been named for my mother's mother, Margaret Rose Landau, who had died the summer before I was born. Rose had been her maiden name. She was the uncle's sister. Uncle Morris had once told me, Rose is your middle name and don't you forget it. That Rose in the middle holds Margaret and Kane together and it will stop bullets if you let it. So far, it had taken me 12 years to become Margaret Rose and in the company of the Meadowlarks, I was finding it harder and harder to be her or the Margaret Rose I thought I was. Without coming down from my bunk, I said to the girls who had gathered around that I would like to know what name they had chosen for me. Come on down and find out, Alicia said. Blair Patiani said they couldn't possibly reveal my name in advance. Then I can't accept it, I said. Heather thought I was teasing and said, aw, come on down. I simply could not allow seven girls who hardly knew me to boil me down to a single word of their choosing. Beckoning with her fingers, Ashley said, come on down now. And I said, I prefer not to. That evening, by unanimous vote, Metal Mouths included, the Meadowlarks changed their choice of nicknames for me. I never found out what their first choice had been, for the one they whispered, and that I was definitely meant to hear, was diapers. It was supposed to humiliate me, but instead, it made me understand what Uncle Morris had meant about my real name, Stopping Bullets. All right, now we're gonna read chapter three. The highway had brought into six lanes when Tartifo nudged his face forward onto the seat cushion and whimpered an invitation to be petted. Tartifo, I said. I waited for him to look at me and tilt his head, <clears throat> his sweet gesture that showed that he was ready to listen. Tartifo, I repeated, do you like your name? I held his face in my hands and brought my face closer to his. It's a good name, isn't it? I like it a lot, and I think you do too. The day I chose not to go on the nature walk, Gloria told me that Mrs. Kaplan wanted to see me. I stood at her desk and waited as she read from my folder. Finally, she looked up and smiled. We are told, Margaret, that today you are assigned to partner Berkeley Sims for our nature walk. Berkeley reported that you told her to tell Gloria you preferred not to go. Mrs. Kaplan continued to smile, waiting for me to respond. No question had been asked, and she had not said anything that needed correcting, so I said nothing. At last, she asked an actual question. Is this true, Margaret? Yes. Mrs. Kaplan closed the folder and pulled out one of the camp brochures from the holder that was on the corner of her desk. She studied the picture on the front and asked, Tell us, Margaret, did you and your parents read the camp brochures that we sent? Yes. Did you watch the video? Yes. After reading the brochures and seeing the video, did you not choose Camp Taliqua over all the others for the very reason that you preferred the activities at our camp? Yes. So, Margaret, tell us why you refuse to participate. I answered, I prefer not to. Do you prefer not to tell us or do you prefer not to participate? Both. Mrs. Kaplan's smile froze. She started to say my name, but only got as far as the first syllable. Her upper lip would not move. Her teeth were parched. She ran her tongue over her teeth and said, now, Margaret, we want you to do something for us. We want you to get into the spirit of Camp Taliqua. She trained her eyes on me before allowing another smile to visit her face. Her head bobbed forward and back, forward and back, forward and back in a rhythm that was either a lot of yeses or an essential tremor which is an idiopathic something that happens to seniors. She was either emphasizing something or showing her age. I watched and waited. She waited too. I think she was waiting for me to cry. I did it. At last she said, Margaret, there are girls who come to this camp year after year after year. For some of them, it is not just the best part of the summer. It is the best part of their whole year. Dry eyed and silent, I watched her head bob. Yes, 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 yes. Like a toy dog on the back ledge of a pickup truck. To keep her up the eye contact, my head oscillated, keeping time with her. Mrs. Kaplan thought I was not resonating, but agreeing, so she said, we want you to get to know these girls, Margaret. There are six of them right in your cabin. She looked down at my folder. Meadowlark, she said. 
and the bobbing, yes, 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 started again. It is Meadowlark, is it not, Margaret? Of course it was Meadowlark. How else would she know that there were six of them in my cabin? To avoid a recurrence of the bobbing syndrome and possibly hypnosis, I avoided making eye contact and nodded. Just once, a st substantial yes. Speak up, she insisted. It is Meadowlark, is it not, Margaret? Yes, I am in Meadowlark. Well, Margaret, there are in Meadowlark cabin six young ladies who have been to Camp Taliqua every summer since they were 10 years old. The alums, I said, matter-of-factly. Yes, there are six in your cabin. Let us give you their names. I know who they are, Mrs. Kaplan. Despite what I said, she continued to call roll, a beat, a name, a nod. Alicia Silver, Blair Patiani, Ashley Schwartz, Caitlin Lorenzo, Stacy Maganis, and Heather Featherstone. The nodding stopped. I guess that since she could start and stop it at will, it was not an essential tremor due to advanced age. Mrs. Kaplan said, you know who they are. Everybody does. Those girls are on the right track, Margaret. It would behoove you to get to know them. Do you understand what I mean? I know what behoove means. It means we want you to become friends with those girls, Margaret. They will show you how to become a true participant in Camp Taliqua. She put the brochure back in the holder, made sure the edges were even, and then asked, now, can you tell us what you do prefer? She began oscillating, yes, 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 again. I watched, hypnotized. Can you tell us what you do want? When I answered, she sent me to the camp nurse for an evaluation. I spent the entire nature walk afternoon in front of the mirror in the bathroom. I practiced facial expressions, putting on makeup, and doing things with my hair. I decided that hair is destiny. The other new girl, Berkeley Sims, had hair that was eager to please. She could blow it straight or let it dry curly. It even had two popular colors, brown streaked with blonde. But given a choice, I would choose hair, like Blair Patiani's. She had quiet but determined hair, long, straight, thick, and very black. My own hair was noisy. It was dark and thick, took hours to dry, and refused to be tied up, pinned down, braided, or twisted into a bun. It was always difficult to manage. When my cabin mates returned from their nature walk, they rushed in to take showers. They went in two at a time, leaving Ashley for last. I heard her run her shower. I heard it shut off. And then I saw Ashley come running out. The water is up to my ankles in there. It won't drain. Something's wrong. Glaring at me, Caitlin said, I'll go get Gloria. Gloria arrived, went into the bathroom, and a minute later came out and said, who did this? The girl shrugged. Alicia said, when we came back, we all saw one of the showers wasn't working, so we doubled up and used the other one. Stacy added, Ashley was last. We forgot to tell her the one on the right was stopped up. Caitlin said, on the left. Stacy blushed. I meant the one on the left. She quickly added, it was working last night. Something must have happened this afternoon when the rest of us were on our nature walk. Friendly guidance. Glaring at me, Gloria said, I'll get Jake to fix it. And that's where we're going to stop for today. So kind of seeing some of the reasons why Margaret Rose was not getting along so well at Camp Taliqua, right? And it kind of seems like it's not as much her fault as uh, Mrs. Kaplan was making it seem at first. So we will pick back up tomorrow and we will see what happens next. Bye guys.